Somewhere beyond this ridge is the enemy. His strength has been sapped by steady aerial strikes. And heavy artillery barrages. But he is still a long way from being defeated. He still has his will to fight. How can we weaken that will? How can we defeat him? By physical force? Yes, that's the most effective way. But there's still another force applied in combat that we generally don't think of as a weapon of war. That weapon is words. Yes, in a situation like this, words are weapons. Now that the enemy has had a strong dose of our military power, the impact of words may provide the final persuasion. Words that go something like this. Soldiers of North Korea, you are surrounded. Your comrades are dying. You will die next. There is just one hope. Leave your positions tonight. This is psychological warfare, or at least it's one phase. As a weapon of war, psychological warfare is no novelty. It is as old as war itself. But the use of this force as an integral part of combat has now taken on new forms. And it works in many different ways. The printed word and the spoken word both hammer away at a single objective, defeat the enemy. On 25 June 1950, the enemy, his morale at its peak, had few weak spots that could be attacked psychologically. Still within 48 hours of the outbreak of fighting in Korea, the UN began waging its Psy War battle in support of our military objectives. First operations parallel the early techniques of World War II, when psychological warfare played a big supporting role in the military theater. Initially, Psy War was forced to conduct a defensive action. Its propaganda was designed to uplift the badly sagging morale of the South Koreans. Then as our military effort shifted from defensive to offensive, so did Psy War. Result? Desertion, dissension, lowered morale, and surrender. Our propaganda was beginning to pay off. Meanwhile, the national program found its stride. On 15 January 1951, at the top army level, Psy War was established as a special staff agency. This move had far-reaching results. In civilian colleges and universities, long-range recruiting and educational programs were instituted. Laboratory experiments and research led to new and better psychological warfare. Reserve units were recalled and several new units activated. And at Fort Riley, Kansas, a Psy War training school was established. Here, recruits with specialized backgrounds were taught the nature, methods, and techniques of propaganda and its dissemination. Coincidentally, plans were launched for the permanent training center, now located at Fort Bragg. Meanwhile, like the fighting in Korea, Psy War operations went into high gear. At General Headquarters, Tokyo, staff planning and supervision are handled by the Saiwar section, while the operating unit in Tokyo is the first radio broadcasting and leaflet group. This group conducts strategic propaganda and supports the tactical operation in Korea. Currently broadcasting in Japan and Korea are 32 radio stations. For about four hours every evening, this station delivers propaganda that thrusts at the communists in North Korea with facts. Radio presents these facts in any number of ways. Perhaps its most rewarding form of expression is news. News is ready-made propaganda, and to an enemy denied access to outside information is as welcome as food and water. 
In addition to news, radio employs other techniques to attract the maximum audience. For example, messages from prisoners of war are broadcast, assuring their families that they are safe and well cared for. These awaited messages induce the enemy civilian to turn his set on. And to make sure he'll keep it on, prisoner of war messages are spotted at different times during the week. Often a radio program takes the form of a drama, such as we see now. Dramatization is close to the Oriental mind, for ever since his earliest schooling, the average Far Easterner has been taught by having things acted out for him. Carefully planned and rehearsed, these dramatic offerings play heavily upon the emotions. There is no strict evaluation of radio's achievement, but with the constant repetition of the free world's point of view, it is certain to have a cumulative effect upon the enemy nerve. In this effort to weaken and harass the enemy, programs are also broadcast from mobile units in the field. Completely self-sustaining, they perform in numerous ways, as a relay station for larger networks, as a stopgap to fill a temporary void, or to lend direct support to the tactical operation. At the Radio Broadcasting and Leaflet Group Central Printing Plant near Tokyo are produced all strategic and many of the stock tactical leaflets. Every leaflet has a central idea or issue which in turn is exploited by any number of themes. For instance, themes may strive to lower the enemy's morale and make him more susceptible to tactical propaganda when he reaches the front lines. In these cases, leaflets stress such points as the UN stand against aggression, the historic friendship between the United States and the people of China and Korea, the unfulfilled promises of communist leaders, and the horror of death away from home and family, along with the mounting numbers of communist casualties. Leaflets also stress the humane treatment of prisoners of war. And finally, the methods of surrender. In the selection of a theme, many factors must be considered. Does it capture the interest of the audience? Does it hold that interest? Above all, does it establish confidence in what we're saying? A theme has been selected. The theme is needless death. First, an artist prepares a dramatic piece of art and the theme comes to life with a grief-stricken mother, visualizing the pointless death of her soldier son. Two versions are prepared one for the Koreans and one for the Chinese. By using overlays, special care can be given to the varying details of the soldier's gun and uniform. Even a small inaccuracy may create a wave of ridicule among the enemy and destroy the effect of months of previous propaganda. The text that goes with the picture is first written in English. With the help of an interpreter, it is then translated into both Korean and Chinese Short, punchy words make their point quickly and fan the soldier's feeling of despair. He is fed the thought that he will soon join the swelling victims of needless death. The final draft is then reviewed, carefully checked for errors. In many red units, offenders found reading UN literature have been shot by the firing squad while their comrades were forced to look on. And finally, the leaflet is approved for production. One index of the leaflet's effectiveness is the elaborate effort the enemy spends in guarding against it. As a weapon of psychological warfare, the leaflet is invaluable. Chinese and Korean soldiers are especially impressed by realistic drawings and photographs. Moreover, the leaflet is far more permanent than the spoken word, for it can be read and reread.
After copy and artwork are okayed, they are photographed and processed. Plates are then mounted on the presses. Although they are warned by their leaders that UN leaflets are impregnated with germs and will rot their hands or make them blind, many prisoners of war have been found to carry them secretly, and the size of the leaflet is such that it can be easily concealed. Leaflets are then packed in rolls so that the maximum number can be carried in one load. They are then placed into bombs. Normally, each bomb accommodates about 22,500 leaflets of lightweight paper. Bombs are systematically loaded into trucks and transported to the airfield. This B-29 is about to range deep into enemy territory. It is a fighting craft, equipped to take care of itself against enemy attack. We can only estimate roughly how many airmail copies of needless death will reach the individual enemy. Nevertheless, overall we do know that leaflets will scatter the seeds of dissension unrest and possibly surrender. In Korea, tactical propaganda is handled by the Saiwar Section, G3, 8th Army. Operating under this section in Seoul is the first loudspeaker and leaflet company. A large share of intelligence is gained by interrogating prisoners of war, done by G2 teams. Special Psi War interrogation teams conduct closer examinations of the prisoners and poll them. Often they speak freely and offer important facts about the conditions they left behind them in their own front lines. This information, when evaluated and interpreted, indicates how effective our past propaganda effort has been. It also supplies the basis for further speaker broadcast and leaflet themes. Since themes are often individually tailored to meet an existing frontline situation, the L&L company must meet that situation before it changes. So that our propaganda can take advantage of the psychology of the hour, tactical leaflets are run off on the company's own presses which can operate in buildings or in vans. Leaflets are disseminated in two ways. First, by air, as we have seen, and second, by artillery shells. Specifically adapted, these 105 millimeter shells can pinpoint selected targets and reach troops in the most localized areas. Leaflet shells can also strike at combat zones in which aircraft would be impractical. In addition, these message-filled missiles are able to penetrate densely wooded areas. Leaflets are printed a color in vivid contrast to the terrain they are aimed at. They are best fired at twilight, since it is still light enough for the enemy to see where they land, yet dark enough to cover him while he gathers up the literature, which is coming to him, Air Express. The loudspeaker platoon of the loudspeaker and leaflet company operates directly with the frontline unit. These loudspeakers are used to get across timely messages to the enemy in close proximity. Furthermore, illiteracy is prevalent among the Chinese and North Koreans, so the spoken message makes our meaning thoroughly clear. When more mobility is desired, loudspeakers are mounted on tanks the physical force of the tank, coupled with the psychological force of the loudspeaker, is an ideal example of Cywar's most effective performance. A similar combination is the airborne loudspeaker. A tactical aircraft, it can reach enemy territory inaccessible to ground loudspeakers. And it can cover both civilian control and guerrilla areas. Because of their nostalgia value, 
the voices of Korean and Chinese women are often used. Some enemy soldiers feel that if a woman can fly over their positions, the communists must be losing the war. In the time that lies ahead, still newer methods of propaganda are growing out of research and experimentation. For Psy War and its media of expression are dynamic, always learning surer ways of breaking the spirit of the enemy. These are the Psy War soldiers. They alone do not win victories in combat, but they have a potent weapon which they use to the utmost to support the infantrymen, the gunner, and the tanker in inflicting decisive defeat upon the enemy. 